second sonnet. It's the second sonnet I received in my life, and it's um, I, I will decide later whether it's it's um, my favorite one. It's quite impressive indeed. So um, with this overly glorious um, invitation, um, letter, and introduction. So thanks for the invitation. Um, thanks for all the efforts and sweat of setting up this wonderful seminar series on uh, of the European Tensor Network Initiative that has already hosted a number of amazing talks in these somewhat awkward times. I hope you're all well and apologies for my shift. The last time was really super painful to see that my computer was unstoppably starting to do updates for no less than 48 minutes. That gave Frank the time to um, compose his uh, wonderful um, sonnet. Now, I'm happy to be here after all. So when I thought of what to speak about, I was a bit hesitant. There have been a number of things that came out this year on Tenzer Networks out of the group, but I thought it'd be nice as a kind of lockdown theme as Frank Polman has put it, to pick a somewhat less conventional topic. And indeed, this is what came out. Sorry, Norbert. I talk on the use of tensor networks as a data structure in probabilistic modeling and for learning dynamical laws from data. And because we have some time, if it allows, let's see how it goes. I will at the end of a bit of an outlook on recent developments on the use of tensor networks to capture strongly correlated quantum systems in a slightly more conventional and less lockdowny um, sense. So the main theme is motivated by the fact that these, there seems to be a number of interesting connections emerging between studies of tensor networks, notions of machine learning and of quantum physics. And in fact, Miles gave a beautiful introduction to this in Benaske not very long ago. So tensor networks capture data with a locality structure very well, as we know very well. And they have numerous applications that come along with powerful numerical tools, as we know even better. And this has motivated many recently to use such tools in the machine learning context and to see what comes out at the end of the day. Now there's more than a superficial resemblance with neural networks and machine learning um, and specifically deep convolutional neural networks with tensor networks. So while neural networks are not tensor network works, their connection is way more than a superficial analogy. For example, it's become clear that um, notions of supervised learning um, with quantum inspired tensor networks can be done. Then of generative modeling using uh, matrix product states as a kind of numerical technique in, in machine learning. It was also, uh, tensor networks have also been used as a, as a proof tool in studies of the expressive power of actual deep learning uh, networks. And um, they have also been used in anomaly detection in the tensor network format that we will have a look at in more detail um, later. There's also the cute ingredient that Quantum circuits may have something to contribute to machine learning in the first place in notions of quantum assisted machine learning with the hope, I mean, let's see how this goes to generate some speed ups over purely classical algorithms, have better generalization in one way or the other or, or so. And that's basically the coordinate system of this emerging um, field. Now, at the heart of this talk are basically two and a half questions in this coordinate system. The first one is a somewhat pedantic question, but not of an unimportant nature, which is, yes, we are excitedly talking about tensor networks in machine learning, but how far can this go? What is the expressivity of tensor networks? In other words, what can we learn from tensor network models about probabilistic modeling? Um, after, after all. The second one, this is a, the first one is a more pedantic and mathematically minded nature. The, more, the second one is more practically minded and asks how one can learn dynamical laws, like nonlinear dynamical laws, also quantum laws from data alone or 
discover dynamical laws in the first place when staring at, at nature and finding out what's going on to discover the underlying physical mechanism in a data-driven fashion. And we will see again that tensor networks are the key tool also, also here. And the half topic, depending on, on how it goes with time, is a quick look at learning tasks within the quantum realm with quantum circuits, where like everybody's talking about this and there's lots of um, plots and, and colorful pictures and also a bit of hype where we wanted to sit down and see what one can prove in this context about puck learning of, of like puck distribution learning, where we have a very nice theorem we are very happy with and where again, tensor networks come into play when looking at noisy circuits in a, a, in a certain way. That's our main lockdown theme for today. Hope you find it interesting. At the very end, I will go over um, some more conventional uh, tensor network endeavors we've been doing on like many body systems where disorder, interaction, and also time-driven dynamics come into play when looking at many body localization and time crystals using PEPs or random tensor networks and properties thereof. The never-ending endeavor with Ersch on the idea of using mode transformations in thermodynamic tensor networks in strongly correlated two-dimensional systems in quantum chemistry, but also in time evolution. I will say a bit more if I have time at the end and holographic tensor models and critical models um, where one can even find analytical expressions for some uh, critical models after all. But again, that depends a bit on how it goes um, with time. So that's on the plate for today and let us start with our lockdown theme on the expressivity of tensor networks as joint work with um, the group of Ignacio Sirac um, and, 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 and our group. So starting point here is the idea of how to use tensor networks not to capture quantum states, but in fact, probability distributions in the context of probabilistic modeling, machine learning, or like spelling out probability distributions as tensor networks. So the starting point of this journey is a concept called graphical probabilistic models, which are structures that embody probability distributions in a, in a clever way. So there's a graph that expresses the conditional dependence between random variables following some distribution that are used in, in machine learning, specifically in generative modeling and uh, super unsupervised learning. So this here is a, is a simple example of such an undirected graphical model, even though in practice it, it more looks like, like, like this. So the point is that such an undirected graphical model defines basically a factorization of a joint probability and the, the maximum cliques in that graph correspond to one term each. It's a, it's a clever way of organizing probabilities with specific dependencies. So graphical models are, can be converted, converted to factor graphs defined on a bipartite graph of factors and variable vertices and, and, and one factor node is created for each maximum clique and the, and the factor is connected to the variables in the, in the corresponding clique. And then one can, can massage this object and um, finds that what one gets at the end of the day is nothing but a, a tensor network state. So a matrix product state, an MPS, a many paper state for, for, good, for good reason. So um, after all, that's just an, an MPS, a tensor train as is sometimes said in this context, although it's just the same thing, except that this is not a tensor train, a, quantum, a matrix product state for a quantum state, but the physical legs going down using the standard diagrammatic notation would be representing classical, uh, classical random variables. So what's the big deal? Well, the point is that we, we love these structures. They're ubiquitous in, 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 the, in the condensed matter context. And, the, and we have all these numerical tools available in, in, in the quantum setting as workhorses. So the, in the context of probabilistic modeling, they're just being used. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fresh field. And this connection between probabilistic modeling and tensor networks is increasingly 
receiving attention. So this is a kind of an, a, a way of linking the, the, the numerical machinery that we have for tensor networks to the context of, of probabilistic modeling. So probabilistic graphical models are tensor trains, matrix product states that capture probability distributions in some way. We can also add hidden layers and look at hidden Markov models. And it takes a moment of thought to realize that they are again matrix product states in a certain way that comes from this um, sequential uh, preparation picture of matrix product states as a, um, a, a quick moment of, of, of thought revealed. So hidden Markov models are also tensor networks. In fact, short quantum circuits, Born machines, if you want, if you do a short circuit and you measure the thing out at the end of the day, if you contract that down, the distribution you get, like in the, in the supremacy scheme a la Google, that's a certain um, setting of this type that produces probability distributions. And indeed, that again is a distribution that can be written as a tensor network. In fact, we just heard a talk not long ago in this series where um, it was shown how this like insight can be used to use tensor network tools to kind of try to come close to the distributions that are found in the in the in the Google supremacy experiment. Also, Frank mentioned this in the conference that um, we had last week on on tensor networks in in in, in Dresden. So, short quantum circuits followed by measurements. Born machines are also tensor networks. So these are all tensor networks that give rise to probability distributions. They represent probability distributions in, 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 in one way or the other, but there's more than one way of writing a probability distribution in terms of a tensor network. So how, what is their expressivity? And the, 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 the question at the heart of the matter is there's many ways of writing tensor networks in terms of um, tensor, uh, uh, probability distributions in terms of tensor networks, but if you go from one representation to the other, what is the overhead or what is the expressive power of a representation? Or in yet other words, how can we spell out meaningfully probability distributions in tensor networks also with applications and, and numerical techniques in mind? So what is the expressive power of distributions expressed in terms of tensor networks, which is a question that can ind indeed be pretty much tackled in all um, uh, um, glory and, and, and generality. So what are meaningful representations? The simplest one is just to take a matrix product state, a tensor train, whatever you, you, you like to say. There's a, a TT rank that takes the role of, of, of a bond dimension. It has the legs sticking out that represent the physical indices representing here, not the, the, the quantum, but the, the classical um, random variables. And it takes a moment of thought to realize that if all the entries in the tensors are non-negative reals, then the, 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 the state, the, 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 the um, vector that you get out represents upon normalization a probability um, distribution. That's one way, a very simple way of, of writing a probability distribution in terms of a, of a matrix product state or, or tensor train. Yet we can also pick a different field, namely the reals, and make sure that the signs are conjuring up in such a way so that the state or the, 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 the vector you get out is still a non-negative real object, so still a probability distribution. You can also take another field, namely the complex numbers, and make sure that the phases of the complex numbers are put together in such a way that again, you get a probability distribution. Oh, that's a third way of writing such an object, like, uh, having a, a, a probability distribution written as a tensor train matrix product state, however you like to see it. But this is not the only way. You can also think of, say, born machines or pure density operators in, 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 in quantum terms, although we are thinking about classical objects here, but, but, but never mind where you have the, the vectors here and the dual vectors showing down. And there's again, the, the, the Born rank now, which is the, the, the Bond dimension. And again, we can think of non-negative reals as tensor entries. We can think of reals, again, 
conjuring up the, 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 the phases and complex valued tensors, which again give three ways of writing um, probability distribution in terms of born machines as um, vectors uh, of, 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 this, of this type. And the third class we look at are so-called locally purified states, or um, in, the, in, in the quantum literature, literature also called um, positive matrix product operators. No matter what you like to call them, they are just um, like positive semi-definite objects where you still have the, the TT rank, the, the, the bond dimension to the, to, to the right, but there's another rank, the purification rank or puri rank that links the two layers. And again, you can think of locally purified states in terms of non-negative reals, reals and complex valued locally purified states. So these are three times three, so nine very natural classes of tensor networks that give rise to probability distributions that are quite different. But to be very sure, these are all complete representations. So though an arbitrary distribution can be arbitrarily well approximated by any of those distributions or these formats, However, they may be different in expressive power in that there may be a big overhead of going from one picture to the other, um, even in the system size in, in, in the way of representing probability um, distributions. Um, so how are these different pictures connected? And there's actually quite big surprises after all. Let's look at the matrix case first of, um, well, just looking at the different representation of matrices, and this diagram here shows um, the like the the overhead of going from one representation shown on the left hand side to another representation shown on the right hand side, and whenever there's a function in this diagram, it means that going from the from the left to the right is possible with an overhead that scales at most like the function that is given in, in, in the table. And some entries are pretty, pretty obvious. Say, if you go from the TT rank to the born rank, it's clear that you have a vector and then you just take the, this, this dude and look at the, the dual vector below that gives a square overhead. So the, the, the born rank will be just the square of the TT rank as um, given before. That's, a, that's um, pretty obvious. Others are by far not obvious. We were banging our heads against um, them for weeks um, to, to, to settle them. When there's a no in the table, it means there's no functional dependence, which means that there can be an arbitrary overhead from going from one picture to the other um, in an unbounded, in an unbounded um, fashion. When there's a star, and there's not many stars in this table, it means that we couldn't um, settle the problem. Well, there's not, not too many, but one is like a fierce problem that we couldn't um, settle. It's the, the fiercest ma matrix problem I'm aware of. So that's a problem for Frank. As my thank you for the, for the sonnet. Um, maybe you have an idea. So it's just a matrix problem where you have um, a matrix written in, the, in, in this form where you have a purification rank and a, and a TT rank, like a... a, 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 a a, a, like a, a bound dimension, and you you contract this with a, with a delta tensor to get the matrix out. And the question is, given such a locally purified state, if you want that represents a matrix, what if you take away the purification rank? What is the type bound to the TT rank you must need on the right hand side to represent the left hand side? So how can you transform one to the other, deleting the purification rank in it with a tight overhead in the in the TT rank? We couldn't tackle it. Although trying for a very long time, I would be, like to see um, the answer of that. Anyway, most other entries um, we, could, we could tackle. Anyway, the heart of the matter is that this can be uplifted to statements as separations for arbitrary system sizes, not for matrices, but for many body um, states, like representing many body probability distributions where one can really say what the overhead is from going from one representation to the other as an expression in the system size for a true many body not quantum state, but for a classical state, if you want for a classical probability distribution. And there's interesting surprises that come out here. There's, these um, representations are vastly different in their expressive power. 
For reasons of time, I will only mention two statements of that kind. The first one is that interestingly, to go complex makes a difference and you reduce the number of parameters. In fact, you can have an arbitrarily unbounded reduction in the number of parameters of the network in the system size when you go from real to complex numbers when you represent a probability distribution. And it seems like absolutely weird. Why would it work and, and help to have a complex value tensor to get a real probability distribution out and actually in, fact, in an unbounded fashion in the system size? Indeed, but that's probably the case. So complex objects like quantum tensor networks are better than, than classical ones to represent probability distributions. Then another surprise, locally purified states or positive MPOs, if you want, they're probably better than any other representation in their expressive power, again, in an unbounded fashion in the system size. And again, you would think, well, why, why would this purification rank help to reduce the number of parameters you need in an unbounded fashion in the system size? Again, it's probably the case. Um, and there's a couple of other surprises, but we, these are maybe the, the strangest insights um, we had in, 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 in this endeavor. And this is like a more kind of conceptual setting, but this can be also used in the context of, of machine learning um, algorithms. And this expressivity is indeed matched by the ability to learn distributions um, from data. And in fact, the, the representation of the distribution makes a lot of difference in the actual practical performance of the machine learning algorithm to learn distributions um, from, from data. So the lesson here is that this has been like an endeavor of a, of a rigorous assessment of the expressivity. Tensor networks can represent not only quantum states, but appropriately local, if you want, probability distributions. They are very useful in the machine learning context, but the way you represent it and the expressive power can lead to surprises. There's vastly different ways of doing that, but this is an, also a nice playground to tackle the question of expressivity that's often just swiped under the carpet and not really um, uh, uh, tackleable with reasonable tools here. One can really go to the full description of how powerful tensor networks are to capture something. We need more of that, of understanding how powerful certain representations are and what overheads um, you, you, you have. Uh, Jens, I have a question. Yeah. Can you give us hi, some, yeah. some, hi uh, can, some indication why using quantum numbers is so much more powerful than just using real numbers. Do you have some intuition that you can convey on that? Um, you just well, I mean, I, interestingly, not, not really, because I mean, I, I have intuition on the matrix level, why it would help, but um, I have not a good intuition why it would help in a way that is unbounded in the system size. So you can kind of tune the, 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 the complex phases in such a way that the overhead, the reduction of numbers is unbound in the system size. And for that, I just have a proof. And, and, and like the idea of how you lift the matrix case in a scalable fashion to the, to the many body case, but that gives you a, a proof tool. I wouldn't quite have a good intuition why that is. And, and I still find it surprising that it, it does seem to help so much. And that's also matched by the actual performance. So um, yeah, I'm happy to say more about the, the, the proof techniques at the end of the talk, but I have to disappoint you that I have not a good intuition, which in some ways good news because it, it does add to the surprise value of, of the statement. Although you might have been happier with a more intuitive answer here. Okay. Yeah. So the separations remain stable under errors. That's interesting to see and important to know. Similar ideas can, should be, and are in our group and also in others looked at in the context of quantum approximate optimization. So variation quantum circuits where people want to find out what the expressive power of certain quantum settings is. That's a very important uh, question if you want to understand what the potential is of near-term quantum computers that everybody's talking about. If one wants to make a rigorous assessment of that idea, that power, we need more of these tools of understanding the expressive power and what could be better suited for this than using tensor networks in this endeavor. Also structured quantum circuits. So this is kind of a, a baby step in an interesting direction of rigorously assessing what you can do, what you can 
how can you approximate stuff in a structured fashion using tensor networks here in probabilistic modeling. Which brings me to the second flavor of our theme of learning classical and quantum dynamic laws with tensor networks once again. So what does it mean learning a, a nonlinear law, like learning some underlying dynamical equations of motion? Well, it means that you just want to find some differential equation, some right-hand side of a dynamical law by staring at a system, by looking at, at nature and finding out what's going on. So learning the, the equations of motion as differential equations on trajectories of real variables. And that endeavor has, has been ubiquitous in the natural sciences for a couple of hundred years. Say when Kepler was staring into the sky and looked at these funny points walking around, it took a lot of data and um, like numbers of hours of staring into the sky and the genius intuition of Kepler to find out the right-hand side, which would then go into Kepler's laws of finding the dynamical laws of planetary motion. Well, here you have a small number of um, parameters and also the genius of Kepler to find out the dynamical laws. This is much less obvious if you have many degrees of freedom, complex systems in biology, fluid mechanics, whatnot, where the curse of dimensionality sets in in complex systems where there's no hope. One can intuitively understand what's precisely going on where data is ultimately what there is. And that's something that is receiving a lot of attention in mathematical and theoretical biology in particular, where people want to find out what the underlying dynamical laws are after all. So what is very common and what people do in this kind of data-driven mindset is they think of going into the lab or, or doing observing a system at snapshots in time, m snapshots in time, observing the system, estimating derivatives for the right-hand side, and then see what differential equations, what right-hand sides are compatible with the observed setting to understand the governing equations from observations of pairs of snapshots and um, uh, derivatives um, that are being estimated. And that's kind of learning the physics from observations in a data-driven um, fashion. So what one can clearly do is we have to find a way of expressing stuff in terms of something. So one has to pick a dictionary of basis functions in which one expresses things. And one can construct a transformed data matrix that evaluates these functions at these m different snapshots in time. And then one has to estimate the, the right coefficients for that and make it like a, a, a recovery problem where one finds as a cost function, say the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of the things you observed with the data matrix that is evaluated as a least square um, fit problem matching best with the observed data. And if you want to be fanciful, you can also um, add like a one norm as, as people say as a regularization to enforce a, a sparse way of representing that. Um, so uh, apply like Occam's razor if you want and, and find the, the simplest dynamic law that is compatible with the data in the two norm sense. And um, this is um, what's the base of so-called Cindy of sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics that does find a sparse coefficient matrix in the sense. So here, this picture shows the outcome of a sure circuit that's a particular chaotic circuit where the guy looks at the, at the, at the dynamics in a data-driven fashion and you would recover what's coming out um, at the end of the day by using that type of recovery where you really learn the underlying physics, the principles, the, the dynamics from data alone. That's cute and it's nice and it's very useful. It's a, this is a highly cited paper in, 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 in the meantime that said, there's clearly limitations when you come to large systems and look at systems where many degrees of freedom come together 
and where there's no hope to express things in terms of function, uh, like exponentially large function dictionaries, you need some sort of meaningful structure, some hypotheses. So what are meaningful, well-defined hypotheses after all? Now, well, um, it takes a moment of thought to see that if you take a product basis ansatz of local tensors, if you want, any function um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the span of a product basis can be expressed as a tensor with legs sticking out with exponentially many entries where this tensor now does not represent no, it does not represent a quantum state nor a probability distribution, but a collection of functions over a product function dictionary. And the key structural assumption here is that one takes the scissors out and assumes or like sets, looks at the setting where it's a good hypothesis to, to cut this tensor into pieces and look at a, a matrix product or tensor network representation of these, um, these functions. So one expresses the basis dictionary as a tensor network over product functions that respects locality and a natural correlation structure in quite the same way or a similar way as a quantum state would represent a short ranged, or a quantum tensor network would represent a quantum state with a short ranged um, correlation structure and an area law. So this would be a, a local function structure if you want as a way of um, representing basis elements. That doesn't only work for basis elements, but it also works for sets of functions. And there is several ways one can incorporate the data tensor into the problem in a, in a recovery problem of the type that we have in mind. So one way is to make sure that each tensor core, each tensor inherits an additional data, an additional index that encodes the corresponding equation. These additional indices are then contracted with a, with a delta tensor that selects the appropriate tensor core for each equation component. One can also make use of a selection tensor that selects the core that gives rise to a single to single functions. And we can also just append a single extra data leg to one of these um, cores just at some point. But that also is a big, a big bond dimension because it, it, it feeds in all the data into, into the problem. Should be clear that each of these representations is sufficient, but they're different. And it should also be clear that an understanding of the involved ranks of tensor ranks, bond dimensions is specifically important when one wants to find um, good numerical tools of recovery and get good recovery after all in any of these um, approaches. And um, it also takes a moment of thought that this can be cast into the form of recovery problem a bit in the compressed sensing mindset, where um, again, we want to kind of minimize a, a Frobenius or a two norm, but now the subject to the structure assumption that there's a, a tensor network structure behind it, not over states nor distributions, but over function dictionaries in this in in, in, in this way, but quite as a qu quite nicely as a natural recovery problem, after all. And then one can say lots of um, things on of an analytical and also of a numerical kind. Um, that's actually the meat of our our, our work. For example, one can find the pseudo inverse of the data tensor. Um, with one sweep, if you want, compute in, in, in polynomial time, where if you uh, nicely explore the left and the right normal form of doing that, that's a conceptual insight, more um, pragmatically speaking, um, in either of the mentioned formats, it's very important to get a stable recovery to have a, a good rank adaptive schemes that nicely matches and monitors the, the various ranks that come into play. We have made the best experiences with um, a new type of rank adaptive steam called a stabilized alternating least square. So salsa that produces good results in, in, in numerical recovery in, in data or from data in, in, in this sense. And this works very well. 
and gives rise to an efficient um, recovery. Here, this um, is an example of um, a Fermi pasta ulam zingu problem. That's a problem of beds which are coupled by springs within a nonlinear fashion where the dictionary has been the dictionary of the first four Legendre polynomials per site uplifted to a function dictionary for the full um, many body system where from reasonable data one can indeed by staring at the problem learn what's going on um, behind the scenes just by looking at data alone which is um which is cute so one can learn classical dynamic laws from data using tensor networks which don't represent quantum states no distributions but now function dictionaries but with the same logic of tensor networks that we love in the in the in the more conventional quantum context quantum models so how can we learn quantum laws from data and that means how can we learn hamiltonians from data in a data driven fashion that's again practically very important it's important in the quantum technology is also foundationally important i've not never given a course in quantum mechanics one where i did not talk about Schrodinger's equation and then somebody asked me yeah but where does the hamiltonian come from and then i say oh it kind of specifies the system it's given and then the students ask me yeah but where is it why is it given i mean who, who gives it to us it's kind of known and um Usually the students are not very happy about this. And, and I tend to say then, yeah, there's a, there's a point to it. There's no voice in the lab speaking to us what the Hamiltonian is, or if there is, then we have maybe other problems. Um, um, never mind. The, often in, in many cases, you want to be very sure about the precise Hamiltonian that you have in the lab in a data-driven fashion, looking at numbers and staring at the data that you have in, in the lab. That's a very natural problem in, I mean, you have structural assumptions. Sometimes you have a many body system where there's just one parameter that may be unknown in a um, parameter estimation problem. You can pick a full operator basis and say, oh, I have a full tomographic recovery of an unknown Hamiltonian. This would be like the model classes that you consider in a, in a natural problem. Usually there's some like concept class of Hamiltonians that is, is sitting there and you want to recover the coefficients of the problem from time series alone, taking at different snapshots in time up to some tolerance level. And from these data, you want to infer about the Hamiltonian after all. That's not such an easy problem because, well, you have an exponentially large Hilbert space. That's very annoying. Then the problem is quadratic in in the exponentials and it's also non-linear in the Hamiltonian as e to the power of something which is non-linear and the guy you want to recover this is um this is actually quite annoying which makes the problem pretty eerie from a robustness perspective and you really want to apply this in a, in, a, in, a, in a practical context if you've looked at the problem from two angles um one is a very tensor networky and like more machine learning and less mathematically rigorous approach where we just took the state, we did a variant of TBD, like a, a, a time evolution algorithm um, involving the, the quantum states and the variation parameter of the Hamiltonian problem, then did time steps, TBD time steps, and checked whether the time is in the respective time windows that we looked at. If yes, we looked at the output probabilities at the end of the day as a, as a born machine, computed the loss function as say the um, negative log likelihood and then made a kind of stochastic gradient um, method on top of that to um, uh, uh, update the respective parameters in a kind of machine learning inspired setting. It's a, a brutally simple idea that works um, shockingly well. So it works well to like learn a Heisenberg type Hamiltonian within a given concept class, again, from data alone in, in, in this fashion, also in the scalable fashion, because we can clearly easily go to, to large um, system sizes. If you really want to look at actual data, like very noisy data and go into the lab, things can be hairy. And we are just collaborating with, with Google AI in, in Santa Barbara on learning models of an unspeakably simple type, one might think, 
although the 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 the, the problem uh, well led to a lot of a loss of hair somehow, um, it's um, quite complicated to get it robust to noise, as I will explain in a second. But the model class is very simple. It's just non-interacting bosonic systems or um, the one particle sector of an of a disordered bosonic system, if you want, just a hopping type Hamiltonian, where the single particle sector is sufficient to learn the, 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 the coupling matrix. So clearly you have a polynomially sized or linearly sized Hilbert space dimension. Also the operators in the Heisenberg picture transform linear, linearly if you make the right preparation and the right measurement. So you can basically assess the coupling matrix as is in the, in, in the system. So what's the big deal? One might think, well, it's still tricky to, with good accuracy from data, learn the underlying Hamiltonian, which took us like almost two years to, to, to get to work, which seems weird given the simplicity of, of, of the problem. But after all, it's a recovery problem. You can go to momentum space and you see that the, the data you get are like basically like, a, 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 like sinoids with the frequencies being the frequencies of the respective Hamiltonian. And you ultimately just have to find the, the frequencies and then the eigenvectors that correspond to the, to the problem. The trouble is that you have to find these frequencies to very good accuracy, to enormous accuracy. What they've been doing is just make a Fourier transform, a discrete Fourier transform, which will not deliver anything on the eigenspaces because the accuracy of the frequencies is, is actually not high enough to get in, 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 in this fashion, which seems um, interesting. So what one needs to do is that well, one first needs to um, superimpose the signals to achieve a bit better signal to noise ratio in, in, in a way so that you get a one value whenever you have a peak and a zero otherwise, and then find the eigenfrequencies of this guy using super resolution methods that's better than the spacing of, a, of the, 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 the discrete Fourier transform. And then based on that accurate recovery of frequencies, recover the eigenvectors either by a convex relaxation of the quadratic problem to a convex quadratic problem or better by a manifold optimization over, um, over the respective um, eigenspace. And that works extremely well also in a robust fashion um, with data with some details that I swipe under the carpet. But in the end, we made it to work as a kind of learning algorithm of Hamiltonians to enormous accuracy under realistic and noisy conditions. So that worked well enough to have the best characterized superconducting devices with super mega, super megahertz um, regime together with the team around Petrum and, and Ben at, at Google AI. It's a part of this quantum supremacy chip that they've been using. It's a particularly nice corner in the, in the, on, on, on a chip, which is also hilarious in the outcome because uh, using our technique, we found that sometimes the, the Pauli Z was actually flipping in the, in the wrong direction without noticing. But using this technique, we found out that sometimes on the chip, the, the Pauli Z was actually pointing in the, in, in the wrong direction. You can't make that up. It's, it's, it's also a bit funny. That said, it's, it's um, nice that this kind of delivers like actionable advice that you can recover things to enormous accuracy and go back to the lab and say what you need to improve to get a better recovery at the end of the day. Um, so lesson, tensor networks give good results when staring at, at nature, so when learning dynamic laws from data, like learning classical nonlinear laws, but also quantum laws, Hamiltonians from data. When you say, I go into the lab, I want to find out what's going on, conceptually speaking, but also practically speaking, say in, in biology, when you want to learn the underlying nonlinear laws, or in the quantum technologies where you want to find out what is my Hamiltonian, but to very good precision when you want to think of analog simulation of some type. That's a baby step. It's an interesting baby step. One can go further, look at hierarchical project entangled pair tensor networks, also in the classical realm. But it would be nice to have a PEPS algorithm, say, of classical dynamical laws, um, which would, would use, surely be a useful setting. More mathematically minded would be good to have recovery guarantees in the compressed sensing sense. Again, ideas of expressivities. We, we love and know all these results on area laws, like Brandy entropy and area laws and the implications for the approximatability with tensor networks. Here, it's, it's actually much weirder and fiercer to have tensor networks over function dictionaries, where it's not obvious 
what good correlation measures are to know that this tensor network would actually approximate my given right-hand side in a, in, in a certain fashion. So there's kind of entanglement features coming into play, but to capture um, function spaces, which is actually um, quite interesting. So my half topic, I will keep this short because I promise to be um, not long, maybe a final thought on quantum, quantum learning or puck learning. Um, this is actually the, one of the results I was happiest with that came out of the group in the last year on quantum assisted machine learning that every, absolutely everybody's talking about. It's a field that was receiving a lot of attention, maybe too much. It's a bit of a hype field where people look at data and, and hope for um, a quantum speed up of some sort in machine learning in a quantum augmented sense. Of course, that's a, a big promise and it's an important setting where we wanted to know what's kind of going on and what one can prove in this setting. And a particularly clean setting is the puck learning setting where one takes samples and wants to, with high probability, probably, so at least one minus delta, have a generator that spits out samples that are very similar to the ones you got in the first place. So with a distribution that's close in the trace distance or so, or kullberg leibniz distance, which is like approximately correct. That's a very clean setting. And what we could prove is that indeed quantum systems, quantum devices, quantum algorithms perform exponentially better in learning tasks than classical um, machines. So there is a smoking gun if you want. You can do better with quantum devices over classical machines in, in, in learning tasks. I should say that's not a NISC algorithm. So that's really a, a quantum algorithm using a full-fledged quantum computer using also ideas of security in, in, in quantum computing as, as a proof tool. It's still interesting to know that this, um, this works well and, and there is a ground that quantum machines can learn better than classical machines. Um, that said, the real fun starts where one understands what's happening under noise and how one can learn classical and quantum distribution, uh, uh, distribution classes that are defined by local noisy quantum circuits. And you want to kind of learn what circuits you have from data in a noisy regime. So that's the, the actual question at the heart of the matter, or how we can learn noisy circuits with other qu noisy quantum circuits where we have a couple of Go and Ogo theorems put together that we are just heavily working on these days. Again, all in the realm of tensor networks, um, kind of describing noisy quantum circuits in, in this setting. So the lesson here is tensor networks help in assessing the possibility of learning distributions from quantum circuits. We have proven this for the full-fledged quantum computer, which is nice to have. I'm very happy with this result. This will come out tomorrow, actually, in, 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 in quantum. That said, the fun starts with in the noisy realm where we use tensor networks as our scheme. Which brings me 47 minutes to the end of the talk. I have an outlook on tensor network activities. I keep this rather short, but I will nevertheless say something to, to keep my promise. We've been doing a lot of stuff on tensor network, like 2D PEPs um, approaches to study disordered systems or interacting disordered systems, asking questions of many body localization where this order was implemented by having auxiliary system so that the tracing out of this extra system would give rise to the precise disorder average or systems where we have disorder interactions and time periodic drive to look at discrete time crystals, which generates an quite interesting situation relating to what Roderich was actually speaking about in, in, in Benaski, where you can think of phases of matter that have a discrete, um, like a symmetry breaking in discrete time and space, and you can cook up schemes of discrete time crystals using tensor networks until intermediate times, because then at some point the entanglement growth is too much. So you can look at settings, giving advice what to do, but you still have to do a quantum simulation to go to long times and really see whether you have just not a, a pre-thermal time crystal, but a proper time crystal, giving some impetus and a, and a blueprint how one could think of a, of a quantum simulation of a discrete time crystal using tensor networks as a kind of classical simulation tool. That's a kind of a cute approach to the problem that nicely links to what Wodach has talked about. Then 
we have this eternal ongoing effort with Ersh. I spoke about this last week at the Tensor Network meeting of having not only Tensor Networks, but having the manifold of Tensor Networks augmented by mode transformations and having joint optimizations of the manifold of Tensor Networks with mode transformations, which works well in interacting 2D systems. Where one starts with a snake and lets the system find the best basis that's best representing the 2D lattice. We are about to update this paper tomorrow with new numbers, which is interesting because if you represent the 1D system um, of, of a 2D model and cut it in two, you will find an area law with an upper bound of the entanglement entropy independent of the bond dimension, uh, uh, like un, un, uh, upper bounded independent of the bond dimension, which is interesting. Or time evolution, where you disentangle the system in time and you can go to longer times than the known methods of um, using time, uh, tensor networks for quenched um, time evolution. There was a paper that just came out a couple of days ago on random tensor networks in a more mathematically minded sense as a kind of disordered system where we could show that see, the systems strongly equilibrate in time in a provable fashion where you think of a um, tensor network where each of the tensors is drawn in a high random IID fashion where one can do lots of, you could also pr prove bounds to the gap of the transfer operator and so on. You can prove lots of things on these random tensor networks as a nice playground to look at generic phases of matter if you if you want. Maybe the the the, the strangest or the cutest result we had was a kind of an endpoint of an endeavor on our um, efficiently contractible match gate tensor networks to look at holographic models. Alexander Jan just gave a talk, I think, in the in the group seminar of Frank in 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 um in, in his in, in his group where um, we have been looking at models of, of that capture aspects of the ADS CFT correspondence where one interestingly can think of simple Majorana Daimler models that have like an inflation rule to give rise to models that are not only critical, but where one can in an analytical fashion compute say entanglement entropies on the, on the boundary that would match the CFT formula of a, of a conformal field theory. So I have a critical model on the boundary which one can actually compute in, a, in an analytical fashion as an infinite sum. So I can even find a model of a CFT up to the quasi crystalline symmetry of the problem. So up to this extra symmetry, one can really construct CFTs as tensor networks, which is, which is a good thing. So you have a kind of an analytical formula of expressing CFTs up to this extra symmetry in terms of tensor networks. If interested, ask me more about this um, after the talk, which, Anyway, I keep my promises. Let me um, summarize and come to the end of my talk. So this talk was, as I had announced, for better or worse, was the lockdown theme of thinking of how tensor networks can be used in this machine learning context in the wider sense in probabilistic modeling and so on. And we looked at the power of using tensor networks in probabilistic modeling in the first place and had like, strange, and Jan was also mentioning that, ideas on how powerful tensor networks are with surprises, but that's also a nice kind of baby playground to understand how powerful certain structured um, uh, tensor networks are here, where one can get a, a pretty much complete understanding of how well one can capture probability distributions of many body systems in terms of tensor networks and what this has to do with the performance of machine learning algorithms based on them. Then we said, how can we go into the lab and find dynamical laws from data and see what's going on by staring at nature, staring at the chip at Google and so on. Never mind seeing what's going on and try to understand what is there. And we again found that if you want to make this scalable, then tensor networks are a tool, not for quantum states, nor for distributions, but in fact for function dictionaries, which is a a fresh realm of using tensor networks as structured ways of representing function dictionaries in a quite practical and pra uh, um, pragmatically minded sense that people um, can use. And then we had kind of a brief look at how tensor networks help in analyzing quantum circuits. And there is a smoking gun that quantum machines can do better in learning tasks. It is what it is, but that's good to know that quantum devices can do better and tensor networks help to understand how much this idea sustains in the present 
importance of realistic noise levels. And I had a quick look at some more conventional quantum applications of tensor networks that we've been using in the last months and, and weeks and so on in, in various flavors. This was short, but I'm happy to say more about this if you ask me to. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the questions you might possibly have. So thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Jens, for this very nice and inspiring talk. So indeed, uh, I'm sure there are some questions. Well, maybe I can start if, if, if nobody else has uh, a question. Actually, I have, um, I was a bit puzzled by your uh, learning Hamiltonians um, problem. Yeah. I would guess that that what you, 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 you want to do is basically prepare as almost everything in a mixed state. If you want to learn what a Hamiltonian is of a many body system, just prepare almost everything in a maximally mixed state, except let's say two qubits, evolve the system, and then just look at, of course, the evolution of these two qubits. And, and, and that will allow you to kind of get, so you, you didn't talk about optimization of the initial state. Ah, um, that is a good- then, you don't, then I don't see the purpose of actually doing it, the learning the Hamiltonian as a whole. It, it should be much easier to, to learn it somehow piece by piece. Well, in, 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 in some, I mean, I, I, look, I looked at two ways of doing that. And in, 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 in the second way, we very much did that. So if in, 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 the, in the first way, we looked at specific initial states that would be suitable for learning Hamiltonians by propagating them with, with tensor networks. In the first, in the second part, we looked at different particle sectors. For example, the single particle sector where we very much optimize the initial state, namely to have a single excitation and then use that single excitation and explore that subspace as, an, as you say, an optimized initial state. Of course, you could also put in two states, uh, two, two excitations, and then uh, uh, exploit like fourth order polynomials in the, in, the, in the coupling and look at interacting models. So indeed, this not only makes sense, but we have looked at that when you say of optimizing initial states so that you can, uh, well, say, um, explore the, 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 the subspace that interests you. So in some way, we have done that. But that's a good point. Um, and, 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 and the second point is that even if you restrict your initial states and your, your measurements very much, then it's still tricky to make this suitable and, 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 um, and sustainable and um, stable in the, in the presence of noise. So even in the most crazy of all problems. But there's this well-known result that, of course, state uh, um, process tomography is much easier than state tomography in the sense that that even with very few samples, you can do exact reproduction, basically, of, of, of what the Hamiltonian is. No? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, of course, a topic that we are yeah, much concerned with these days um, on, on, for example, spam robust channel estimation or so or, or shadow estimation. Um, where you get sample efficient um, and spam robust insights into channels, but be careful that channel tomography is not quite the same as Hamiltonian tomography. I mean, yeah, I mean, not even cross rank one tomography. I mean, one is the exponential the form of the other, and that makes quite a difference. It, that's a quite subtle fine print. I mean, this e to the power of something is 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 it makes quite a difference when it comes to wanting to know the unitary or the Hamiltonian that generates the unitary, which is interesting also in, in, on the level of making it robust to noise. So in this sense, it's not quite right that channels are easier, but well, in, the, in this sense, it, it is what it is. Um. Okay, so please, more questions? Jan, please. Um, yeah, maybe along the same vein um, of learning Hamiltonians, Suppose I'm only interested in the low energy sector of a complicated problem um, and I have some way to generate time evolution for the full system and then I want to come up with an effective Hamiltonian for the low energy sector which, which involves less degrees of freedom um, but describes that low energy sector well. Would you see a way to adapt your method to such a setting? So you want to come up with an effective description of a simpler subsystem. 
Um, well, the uh, yeah, I guess and no. I mean, th there are some things which are known, some things we know, and some things that would be interesting, but we haven't really explored yet. I think it's the fair answer. One thing is, indeed, it helps to only want to look at subspaces. That's, for example, known that um, also a um, like the 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 the, the the classical and quantum simulation of low energy sectors is cheaper than the full thing. Like even when you do like look at product formulas and so on, or or, um, or look, uh, linear combination of unitary formulas to have a quantum computational um, simulation of a many body system, it does help to look at low energy subspaces. That, that was work by Los Alamos, also Ignacio Sirac had a paper about this um, just recently. So it, it, it does help. That said, um, in our learning task, we have not yet explored that, only that we look at this uh, bosonic Hamiltonian problem in a layered fashion by looking at finite particle number subspaces. So that's a kind of a, a subspace problem of a kind. It's a kind of a baby version of, of what, you, what you've said that can be seen as a low, a low particle number sector, which is then easier. But I mean, I think that the, the true surprise value is that even the simplest of all problems are strangely eerie and, and, and tedious if you really want to make it work with data that are living up to, to high precision. That's maybe the biggest surprise value, that you can't make it too simple. It's still not so easy to, to get it to run. So it was a fun collaboration. We're just putting out the paper any day, but this was like a two-year ordeal of getting it done, of trying to get it done. And also the, the Google team they didn't make it to work because they they it was not clear that you need to have the frequencies to 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 a better than the the full um, precision in 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 the recovery. So it's kind of funny. That's maybe the the lesson to learn that you have to be very careful with with robustness of the problem to to. Well, so just follow up. You say you need the frequencies so accurately. Yeah. Can the Google team give you those frequencies so accurately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they give us the 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 the, the actual data, the raw data, and then we can we can do that indeed. Mm. Yeah, that's that. That's the case. We get the the raw data from them, and that was really fun because I mean, this that, what I said, like this kind of actionable advice thing of taking data, staring at them, and then looking at a better corner in the experiment. That worked quite well, actually. So this this is um, this was not a show, but an an, an, an an a fun endeavor that there was an interaction of getting data, learning, understanding what's going on, talking back, and 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 staring at the actual system. So. In this sense, we got this kind of sub megahertz resolution um, setting because you can also use that data to, to look at good chunks of your experiment. That's kind of the, the fun aspect of it, even though it's a simple system, but it's a idiotically characterized system. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the good question. Ah, hi, Thomas. Yeah, hi. hi. Uh, may I also ask a question, sure. um, uh, Jens? Yeah. So, um, are you trying to learn uh, the net frequencies or frequency differences? Because usually what you do in spectroscopy would be you would record transitions between eigenstates and therefore you learn about frequency, eigenfrequency differences rather than the absolute frequencies. And in particular, if you want to combine, for instance, your learning methods with, say, spectroscopic uh, uh, results of uh, experiments, then the question is, uh, on which footing would you place yourself best? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question. So, I mean, of course, I mean, in, in our jargon, we were talking about frequencies, but what we were actually doing, and you're right, is, I mean, there's some sort of calibration, and we were actually talking about frequency differences, because as you seem to hint at, that's precisely right, that the, I mean, the, 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 the zero point is just the shift of your of your energy axis somehow that has, of, has no significance whatsoever. So indeed, it was all about differences. Yeah, so mathematically speaking, you wouldn't uh, uh, try to learn about the naked Hamiltonian. You would- uh, It's an equivalence cloud of Hamiltonians, the, yeah. The spectrum of the commutator super operator. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, that's the, the Thomas Schulter Brücke type of saying it. Indeed, you have yeah, yeah. Right. projective what representation. Absolutely right, that's precisely yeah. what we've been doing. Yeah. Thanks, that's a good comment. Yeah, I love it. And that, that works also in, 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 the, in the higher levels. So that, that is a mindset that, I mean, the, 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 the representation theory of the n particles in the respective boxes is quite interesting as you might, yeah. uh, well, 
understand well. I don't and then maybe uh, one uh, t a tiny little fun footnote. Uh, okay. So in the German literature, there is a collection of uh, uh, 150 uh, plus translations uh, of the sonnet uh, number 18. <laughs> Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? So including uh, 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 famous translations by Robert Gernhardt and oh, uh, wonderful. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Enzensberger and so forth. So uh, you will love my it. heroes. I once had dinner with Enzensberger. That was really fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, uh, very, very mathematically inclined. That's right. Yep. And he wrote a book. He wrote a, a mathematics book, which is yes. absolutely fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Der Zahlenteufel. Right. Yes. Yeah. I started to read the part of it to my daughter. Um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and right. and I think he gave an introductory uh, uh, lecture in the 2001 uh, uh, International Conference on uh, of Mathematics in Berlin. Oh, really? That, that I didn't uh, know. And uh, that's uh, uh, there's also a print recording of that, and that's an excellent talk. Wow. I mean, so I, a... I, no doubt it cannot come close to the sonnet of Frank, but <laughs> I'm sure that. Um... That so, that uh, Frank, had. you added uh, to this uh, collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh dear. Okay. Uh, sorry for that. No, no, that's great. Um, good. Thanks for the good questions. So yes, I actually have a question also about one of your uh, of the estimation of this uh, anharmonic oscillators, this coupled yeah, oscillators. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that you you used uh, some polynomials, I guess, to. Uh, to do this, and yeah. I was a bit puzzled because it felt to me that that you should be able to exactly represent that function with the bond dimension three, but nevertheless, in your simulation you had like much larger bond dimensions. Is that correct, or, or am I wrong? Ah, um, well, we are both wrong in a, in, a, in a sense. No, no, that's right. Um, so um. The state, the, the kind of the state or the, the function dictionary is considered in an exact way were like low bond dimension settings. Well, indeed, and so it would ultimately would find. Problems, I would guess that you get it with a polynomial, like a polynomial of bond dimension. You would need at most bond dimension four or something like that. No? To, to, that is right. That is right. It's a low but, bond dimension. In your result, you seem to, to approximate this with much higher bond dimension. Yeah, but this is like, this is like, a, this is kind of true, but um, the, the, the support is strong on a on a kind of a Schmidt value that is strongly supported on, on 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 a low bond dimension setting. So even though the bond dimension is high, it will ultimately find a solution that is uh, respecting a low bond dimension in this function space. So that's a good observation, actually. So that's happening. But when you uh, when when that's your intuition, that's happening. That you you get you get basically the the low entangled state, sort of say, in in, in this function space. Yeah. That's so this right. idea, of course, of represent of using tensor networks for for using continuous function has been used a long time already in the tensor network community for 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 simulating like like u1 theories or xy theories oh yeah 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 like models in which yeah, yeah. also in this representation theory and yeah, yeah, yeah. and all this and Bessel functions and uh, i think it's it's very it's a similar kind of setting probably no yeah there are similarities i mean yeah 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 absolutely i mean there's also some overlap in thinking to these um these works on tensor networks to capture uh, continuous systems yeah, indeed, yeah. Um, you, you must know this. This was like in the in the mid zeros when people thought of like certain linear combinations of Gaussians and so on to capture certain interacting bosonic uh, theories. That's a bit similar to that, indeed. No, no, indeed, there, there's some tradition. Although the the literature is not super rich, and also the the the, the whole question of expressivity of functions of of a structured function dictionaries in that sense. It's, it's very scarce, also in the mathematical literature. Well, of course, of course, actually, that's I, the, the. It's all generalizations of the SVD, basically, no? Yeah, of course. And, how and how can it not? It um, predates SVD, you know, the, the sparseness of functions. This is exactly the Schmidt normal form. Schmidt yeah, yeah. is about functions. It's not about matrices. Oh, <laughs> that's deep. Remember, remember yeah. Marie Petruska, you know, making a big fuss out of that. That, that you should <laughs> not use the Schmidt decomposition for. For matrices, the Schmidt decomposition is for for functions. No, that's a good point. I, I'm I'm with her, and in here it's li literally the case. Absolutely, it's the SVD of in function spaces. Well, it's a generalization of the SVD for functions. That's that's mm -hmm. what you. Do. 
is precisely right. And that's also basically what, what I mean, the, uh, these algorithms are basically doing that in, in, on, on some higher level. They're doing SVDs um, exactly. and um, kind of take care of the ranks and so on. But ultimately, it's like also letting these squares to keep the, the um, function space um, SVDs under control. That's precisely right. Um, yeah, that's a good intuition. So Mary Beth will, will be happy. That is right. That's a long. I have not heard from her for a long time now. Um, yeah, neither have I. Maybe a last question. Sorry that I'm completely hijacking this because if nobody else is asking questions, then I do it. Go for it. Um, I'm a bit confused about your about your 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 claims that these born machines are much more powerful than stochastic, like that that than than tensor networks would only have positive elements actually. Ah. ah, you mean the, I, 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 the when you started your sentence, I was in the realm of this these recent um, tensor networks that, that where you started in Dresden your talk saying, oh, I should have talked about this, but I have nothing to say about this. So I speak about something different, which, <laughs> which was fun. <laughs> I thought you were talking about this, but you mean just the my bone machine, like the the way of using a positive. Um, MPO to yes. represent its and, and then part. basically you double the thing and then you basically yeah. take MPO with itself dagger and then you basically exactly. identify the two outer indices and, and make them equal to each other to get a probability distribution. Yeah, right. So in some sense, this is like looking is. at CP maps, but only considering the diagonal elements of them. So you have some kind of an evolution of CP maps and you only observe the diagonal elements of your density matrix. Yeah, that's the way of putting it. Indeed, okay. that's. But if you do that, that. Oh is no 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 wait 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 wait, wait no 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 that's not it. Plastic map that does the same thing. No no no, it's not quite that. Like not quite. Object. Almost. You're not you're not pinching because the 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 object itself is the distribution. You're not projecting down to some subspace. It's not that you're looking at the diagonal element of a more complex object. The tensors may be complex valued, but the guy. I mean, that's Jan's question. The guy coming out is the plane distribution as is. Yes, that's but it's bit. still okay. I, I, but let's talk about this later. But yeah, I, we I, got over there. But that's a good bit. So that's basically Jan's question. I mean, I have not such a good question uh, answer to Jan's question. But that's the point. The whole the whole dude is the distribution. Although behind the the facade of the of the of the tensors, you have a complex valued tensor network. Yes. What you get yes. out, there's no but diagonal element. As a CP map, you 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 will be able to do it with stochastic matrices instead. That's this whole Ullmann's theorem, no? That, that yeah. Actually... yeah, 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 okay. But this, this is something for, that's maybe a connoisseur discussion because um, let's do this offline. But the, the point is that it's, it's not that you can replace each guy by a stochastic map and then repeat it because that way you would not get a, a difference in expressive power. That's the, that's the point. I, I can explain no, you I'm more why that sure is. About this actually. This is actually I, interesting. Okay, I've not, I've not done it myself, but I really think I, I'm, my gut feeling says it should be possible. No, this is actually the way of, of this that's a cute way of saying that, that um, the, 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 that's a, maybe one good way of putting it, that the, the quantum setting where you have like a, a bond that can be complex valued is strictly more than a, an iterated stochastic map, even if the, the, the legs that you have to the bot, bottom and top are purely classical. That's a way of putting it. Yeah, indeed. That's, well, that's, 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 the way I was, that's a I good was way of putting it. Your talk, and I'm, yeah, that's a way of put, what way of putting it. Yeah, but but certainly there, for any map from diagonal elements to other diagonal elements, there is a stochastic map that does that. That's the whole point. Yeah, but this will, if you see it that way, if you see it as a, as a, a completely positive map, there will be some kind of a, a non-stochastic memory that's passed on, basically. That's a way of putting it. Yeah, it's but not stochastic. It's diagonal, not like diagonal ones and, uh, that are positive and uh, no, but the, the 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 leg in the middle is not not classical. So there's not a a stochastic representation of that channel. That's that's the point. But maybe okay, maybe let's. Uh, let's we not... can do this offline. But this is a way a good way of putting it. That's precisely the surprise value. There's no classical bond in the middle that would pass it on. Okay, I think this is a good way. Yeah. Unless there is an urgent question, let's um, thank Jens for yeah, this. Thanks uh, for the interest. Great yeah. talk. Have a good and, night. Um, we see each other.